The City Beautiful movement arrived with Daniel Burnham, its most notable architect. He designed the Union Station and the Wyandotte Building. But clearly, more was needed. So there was a progressive sense in Columbus with civic-minded citizens, public leaders, uh, elected officials who were concerned about the quality of life in the city and trying to improve it and make it better. The result of this group's efforts was the 1908 plan that was released in February of 1908. Well, the 1908 plan defined Columbus as an industrial city, a state capital, and an education center. And it challenged Columbus to become the most beautiful and well-ordered state capital in the country. The plan called for city parks, not only Franklin Park, but a park along the riverfront and parks for schools. The plan called for a trade school on the west side of the Scioto River. And it called for a grand civic mall that began at the State House and marched proudly over the river into Franklinton, linking the past to the future. While many citizens had input into the plan, one man had the vision and experience to build it. Well, Frank Packard was a nationally recognized architect, Columbus architect. He practiced between the 1890s to the 1920s and designed about 100 buildings uh, in Columbus. He had a vision for his city. It was said that what Daniel Burnham did for Chicago, Frank Packard did for his city, Columbus. So led by Frank Packard, Robert Wolf, who was the editor of the Dispatch, and covered in his cartoon, The Passing Show, Billy Ireland start promoting the idea of the Civic Center to be developed along the riverfront, a grouping of public buildings, and then a park, Victory Park. Frank Packard and Robert Wolf worked behind the scenes. Billy Ireland, though, nudged city leaders to finance a new look for Columbus in a very public way. Billy Ireland passionately cared about his community. Um, and I think it's that love of place that really shows up in, in his work. Over the next few decades, both public and private buildings began to transform downtown. Columbus began to capture the attention of the nation. A great city that had arrived, a city that that was, you know, up and coming, a city that, that was going to be part of the nation. It needed a great art museum. The thought that we need to teach and expose young people to, to the arts, to, to, the, to, the, to the great achievements of the, of the human race. That's what people were thinking. Because, you know, we knew the Columbus Museum of Art was never going to be the biggest museum in the world, but what we wanted was that quality, that very special feeling when you're here, that sort of, intimacy and yet grandeur. Frederick Schumacher gave us his collected masters. Ferdinand Howold, a mining engineer, gave us early modernists. Howard and Babette Sirak gave us the impressionists. The very first painting the museum bought, well, that was a group effort. And right around the same time, we bought our first American painting. We bought it by subscription which is everybody throws in their nickels and their, you know, their quarters and everything. And as a community, we bought a great Robert Henry painting. The crowning jewel of the city was our first skyscraper. Outside of Manhattan, it was the tallest building in the United States at the time. It's 555 and a half feet tall, just taller than the Washington Monument, done purposefully this rebirth of the city. It's this white shining tower on the hill, proverbial. There's images of suns and moons on the lintels that face Front Street. You see the Greek deities of life on one side and the Greek deities of death on the other. At the very top of the tower, there used to be giants and in one arm holding a child and the other arm holding a child saying, 
the AIU will protect you. It had its own radio station, WAIU. It had an observation deck where you could look out and, and see the rest of the city. It's an amazing building. It's Columbus saying, here we are, look at us. This is where we're going to be. This is what we can do.